Hello, my name is Haris Trabradovic, member of SDT International team, and I'll be talking to you today about connecting some reliability dots. When we say connecting the reliability dots, there is a deep and interesting meaning behind it. As you all know, reliability is a complex activity that contains so many different boxes and so many different subactivities within that sometimes we forget that it's at the end of the day, it's all one big box. So doing one activity disconnected from all the others is not bringing a full benefit. So connecting the reliability dots uh, in this context means that we need to see the interdependency between different activities, different technologies, and of course, different people. In that regard, I will talk about condition monitoring for ultrasound technology, but not about ultrasound technology per se, but about the mindset with instead of versus. Because very often we have this approach where there is something against something, uh, discussing what is better, what is more effective, instead of thinking about how to make it complementary and work together. So just to open this topic up, uh, a little bit of medicine and our private life, because I think we all have the same mindset when it comes to medicine and our health. We all care about our health. That's that's undisputable, definitely. Uh, most of most of us predictively and uh, reactively. Some people also proactively, which is really good. Not of all not of all of us do that. Uh, now imagine a doctor using one single diagnostic method let's say x-rays. So doing x-rays and all the examination you can do with x-rays is a very good method. And it's verified, precise, reliable, recognized everywhere. And we have a lot of excellent experts who can do it properly. Now put yourself now in the story and one day you have a headache and you come to a doctor, to that doctor. And that doctor is using one technology, is using x-rays. So you're coming with a headache, and of course, what he does is say, let's do the x-rays. And after several minutes or several hours of examination, he says, you're fine. We detected nothing. So that's, that must be all okay. But in a month, you come there with a rash, with some small problem on your skin. And the same doctor, using the same technology again, because that's all he uses, he says, let's do the x-rays. And of course, half an hour later, he, he says, you are fine, nothing detected. And of course, one day you will come feeling dizzy with a fever, whatever that might be. And the doctor will again do the same routine. Let's do the x-rays and there will be nothing detected. So obviously you are fine. Well, are you really fine? That's a completely different question. But you see where it's going, right? You see that if you're going to the doctor who is doing the same technology and only one technology, he will do the same thing continuously, of course. Now, can we say that this doctor is bad at x-rays? Absolutely not. We cannot say that. He's surely very, very good at that, especially if he's doing that one thing for all, all his life. But would you privately choose that doctor to be your doctor of choice? Well, I don't think so. I wouldn't. And I'm quite sure you wouldn't do it as well. Because when we look at the human body, humans consist of many different parts, many different components. So think about of your human, human body as a system and you have all these different components and they often, if not always, operate in a completely different ways. Compare blood, bones and muscles. They are in a completely, completely different type of tissue. They are com doing completely different function and they can fail in a completely different way. So they have different functions and they can, they can fail in a different ways. They have different failure modes, but they are all equally necessarily for our body to function as a system. Now, of course, human body as a system with numerous components may face many different failure modes. So, I'm sure you, you, you experienced some of the failure modes in your life and, and you fixed that. And those failure modes will come with many different symptoms. 
depending on the stage. So you can have a different failure mode in your body. That failure mode can offer a completely different symptoms and those symptoms will be different at different stages. Now, what doctor would you choose? What would be your doctor of choice to be sure that you run proactively healthy life, you eat healthy, you exercise, you don't smoke, you don't drink, and then you need somebody to do the predictive part of the job and maybe reactive if necessary. So what doctor would you choose? What criteria would be most important there? Now, what I would choose, and I'm absolutely sure we, we, we agree on that, doctor who understands diversity of the illnesses, so he needs to understand there are so many different things that can happen with the human body. So, of course, doctor who understands diversity, diversity of the symptoms. Because if you have so many different illnesses, there will be so many different symptoms. And he also needs to understand different stages. Because the symptoms and consequences will not be the same at different stages. And of course, at the end of the day, you want to be sure that he will approach diagnostic in a clever way. He will need to connect illness to symptom to diagnostic method. And this is exactly what medicine is doing. We have a certain group of illnesses with a certain symptoms, and then you choose appropriate method to be able to detect that symptom. From the very simple measuring your temperature, blood pressure, and all this stuff, up to the MR or CT or all the other methods. Now, that doctor will probably have a clever approach and he will choose the set of methods that cover all suspected failures. You know, as a human, when you come to the doctor, you say, you more or less can say, what is the problem? Why, why don't you feel good? And then intelligent doctor will, will, will choose the set of methods to cover all suspected failures based on what you just told him. And then, of course, he will need to choose method according to detectability at a different stage. This is also quite important. And he will need to choose the least invasive and safest method. Not to open you up every time he wants to know something, but least invasive. And, of course, the safest method for the rest of your body. Now, this sounds much, much better than a guy with x-rays only. Definitely. And that will be the doctor of my choice. And I'm absolutely sure that will be the doctor of your choice. So by saying this, I'm not discovering anything new here. And I'm, and I'm not opening eyes to anyone because this is what you do in your private life. This is what we all do. But this is exactly how medicine works. And this is exactly what you as a patient expect from the medicine, from your doctor, from the hospital, for everybody within. And that's actually why we are so good in saving lives, because we are able to find different illnesses at different stages, and then we know what to do about it. Now, if you boil it down to its essence, what you see here, what I was talking about, is a condition monitoring at its best, because this is the top condition monitoring. You're not talking about machines, you're talking about humans, and human life is priceless. So that means that the condition monitoring of the human body needs to be the top condition monitoring the money can buy. Now, instead of human body, try to think about the pump, but try to keep the same mindset. Now, think of this pump as an organism, and that organism needs to deliver certain function. It needs to pump uh, that much water at a head of seven meters and la la la. Okay, we know what what's the function of the pump is. And this organism or pump has several components, motor coupling, pump, valve, seal, pipes, frame, foundation, all the way to the electrical cabinet. And this part is probably very important because for the pump to deliver the function, it's not enough that the motor is rotating and the pump is rotating. There must be some valves functioning properly. There must be electrical power. So electrical cabinet has really something to do with the with function of this of this uh, pump. So when you look at it as an organism, look ever look at everything that is connecting connected to delivering the function. Now break it down to the subcomponents: rotor bars, bearings, shaft, impeller, volute, all this 
different subcomponent that we sometimes call non-repairable items. And now it's your job to think about all different failure modes. Now, to translate the failure modes and the failure mode effect analysis in a very simple way, it's what can go wrong and what will be the consequences. Now, what can go wrong? Well, I can spill my coffee over, 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 the, over the pump. Well, nothing will really happen. But if the foundation is cracked, something will happen. So we need to think in a mode, what can go wrong and what will be the consequences? And just put one word in between, what can go wrong and what will be the consequences? If something goes wrong, what will be the symptom? Because that's what we are looking for. Now think about the symptom of each failure mode. So you put a list of all failure modes, you connect them with the proper symptoms that they will produce at the, at the different stages. Now think about symptoms that are same for different failures. There, is a, there will be a group of symptoms that cover different failures. There will be symptoms that are unique for one single failure. And think about different symptoms at different stages. So to be very simple, uh, 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 the bearing has several stages and though the symptoms of different stages of failure will be different. Then cavitation has a certain symptoms. They can be quite simple. Some of them can be quite complex. So let's break it down to, to, to all the core elements, to its essence, to create a mindset how to approach condition monitoring. Now think about the symptom of the consequence. So you can have a primary failure, a root cause, which is causing certain consequence in, in, in anomaly in operation, and then you pick up the symptom of that anomaly. Let's also put that in, in, in equation as well, because it's quite important. Sometimes you will not be discovering the, the root cause symptom, but you will be discovering symptom of the, on the consequence. Now think about a symptom of the cause. So if you connect consequence with its cause, and you find the symptom of the consequence quite easily, then you can go to the cause and say, okay, let's look for, for another symptom, which is telling me about the cause. This is exactly what we do in medicine. There is absolutely no difference. Now, some, just an exam, example, some pedantic people did some very pedantic FMEA, in my personal opinion, a little bit too pedantic. They say that there are more than 600 failure modes in a pump, single stage centrifugal pump. Now, that means there is a 600 problems living inside and just waiting to stop the pump. It's just something to keep in mind, just as an illustration. Now, I'm sure we can all agree about this huge similarity between reliability and medicine. Uh, what I can say jokingly that uh, in medicine, the first question doctor asks you when you, when, when you come in, into his office is, good afternoon, what's the problem? And then you tell him something. Where last time I checked, gearboxes don't speak. So there is a slight difference because our patients, assets, machines, they don't speak. But don't forget, they do suffer. So we need to approach the same as a medicine. The only difference is a patient. On one side, there is a human, on the other side, there is a machine. But if you have the same mindset, you can be as successful as medicine today. Now, remember the doctor with x-rays only. Not very successful. As an x-ray expert, he would be very successful. I'm absolutely sure about that. But as a, do as a primary medicine doctor doing everything for you, I don't think so. Now, how can anyone think if you connect these two, these two areas with the same mindset, how can anyone think that we can monitor any machine with one technology? Maybe two, maybe combination of two technologies. That's very strange and very brave because you just need to imagine if you, if you made as an exercise that, that a list of failures with a list of symptoms with the needed technologies to find them at a certain stages, you can see that if you are going to fight this problem with one or two technologies, that's a very strange approach and a very brave approach. Now, still today, we hear statements like this in condition monitoring teams. I can do it all. So I have one technology. I am an expert in XYZ, whatever that might be. 
and I can do everything. I can find a problem on the bearings or on balance, misalignment, I can find electrical problems, I can check the high voltage overhead power line, I can check a pump cavitation, and I can make you a coffee. So that doesn't make much sense. Uh, the next thing you, I, I, I sometimes hear, and you probably sometimes hear, my technology is the best. Uh, my technology is the best, period. Well, if you remove that dot and put comma and say my technology is the best for this failure modes, I would agree. But I definitely don't agree with this because it's simply not correct. And there is a legendary me too. So whatever anyone can do with any technology, somebody says, I can do it also, me too. Now, if there is one almighty technology for everything, uh, that would be actually very nice. <laughs> I, would, I would really enjoy it, but it's not the case. These statements are given very confidently, with a firm voice, with a lot of confidence in it and bravery. But if you ask me personally, if, if, you, if you try to listen carefully what stands behind these kind of statements, they sound very, very defensive and they smell like fear from the human point of view. Now, when I say defensive, defensive means very often defending your own position within the company. So I am important guy, let's say I'm an important guy in condition monitoring. Everybody loves me, everybody respects me. My job is secure because I'm the only one who can understand this squiggling lines and all these spectrums and nobody else can understand it. So don't bring anything new because I want to defend my position. I like my position. Now, defensive can also mean resisting any kind of change. Uh, people at a certain age or at a certain state of mind are not really happy to learn more. So please, let's not change it. Let's not make waves. Everything is nice and fine. I'm just getting used to that and, and, and just leave everything as it is. But don't forget, no change, no improvement. Change is mandatory for any kind of improvement. Doing the same thing all over again, better and better and better, can sometimes mean that you are doing the bad thing much better. Now, damage is being done, and that damage cost company and consequently cost everybody, everyone else. Now, there is an element of fear as well. Fear of new, fear of different, and fear of competition. All three are there. They do exist. Now, fear of new is very irrational because new, anything new should not be feared. It should be examined. It should be accepted and then examined and then used in the best possible way. Absence of new is a problem. Now imagine that you have absolutely nothing new and there are no new things coming. There are no new inventions. There are no new technologies. Where would we be today? It wouldn't be very, very nice place. Each technology was new once. We shouldn't forget that. Every technology you have as a well-established technology was once new. And even that, when it was new, it was a mimic of human senses. So when we speak about ultrasound is improved hearing. When we speak about, we will speak about vibration, it's improved feel of touching. When we, when we talk about thermography, it's, it's improve of, of our vision. So there's really nothing to be feared of. We're trying to improve our senses in many different ways. Now, fear of different is also very rational because different makes us better. Because that is the only way we learn. When we, when we, when we have an influence from another technology, then we can learn more about what we are doing and how we can be better together. Different is not a competition. Different is just different. It's a different approach, different features, different possibilities. Now, fear of comp competition, that's very, very common, very, very common, especially in, a, in relatively small, tight teams that work together for years. But honestly, there is no competition because the word team is completely opposite of competition. It's just team that gets bigger and better, uh, being more diverse and being much, much more effective. 
Some of you can probably remember the time when the people were listening to the bearing with a screwdriver. One technology, several guys. Today, we are much more effective. And the reason for that is because we accepted new technologies. We accepted diversity. So we evolved quite a lot. Now, considering com competitiveness, how can Luka Modric, a very good football player, or Branko Ivanković, a very good football coach, be competition to Alireza, Beiravand, or Beiro if they join Boa Vista Football Club? So this Alireza is a goalkeeper in the Boa Vista Football Club. And just imagine Luka Modric signing and Branko Ivanković signing. How can they be competition? They, they do completely different jobs within the team. They have completely different roles in the same team. What can happen, they can make each other better. They are different. The one is a goalkeeper, the other one is a midfield, and the last one is a coach. Different talents, different abilities, different tasks. And they contribute to the team in a completely different way. Now, saying I can do it all, my technology is the best, or me too, creates completely wrong approach. It creates versus instead of with. We need with. We need to add technologies. We need to add abilities, add knowledge, not creating this versus approach. Nothing should be against something else. Now, you see this very often. Let's compare vibration versus ultrasound. Let's compare thermography versus ultrasound. Let's compare oil analysis versus vibration. That's, that's nonsense. That, those things should not be compared. They don't do the same thing. They are completely different. Because versus, in, versus in, in, in essence, means conflict against. Conflict means casualties, always. And the casualties, at the end of the day, are our assets. Casualties is a benefit of our company. So the more casualties we create by creating versus means that the profit and, and well-being of the company will be less. At the end, all of us, we become casualties. So it shouldn't be the, the choice. This approach should not be your first choice. Now, several things around this mindset and uh, to be used as a very, very useful rule is, is the question, is condition monitoring needed at all? Now, there are many people uh, who are doing condition monitoring who sometimes get struck with this, with this question, because what do you mean is condition monitoring needed? Of course it's needed. Yes, uh, but the answer lies in, 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 in RCM. The answer, answer lies in many other reliability boxes that you need to consider before even starting condition monitoring. Criticality analysis, failure mode effect analysis. Because if it doesn't bring benefit, it shouldn't be done. There are many cases uh, and many situations when condition monitoring doesn't really bring any benefit. If there is no benefit of doing it, we shouldn't be doing that. Because if this machine fails, the cost is absolutely minimum, the safety risk is, doesn't exist, and uh, it's very cheap, there is no financial problem. So there is no benefit in doing expensive condition monitoring using our valuable scarce resources on this asset. So it shouldn't be done. And it takes a good mindset and a lot of bravery to say, no, I will not do it. I'm good at my condition monitoring, but I will not do it on this asset because it doesn't bring benefit. Whatever you do, you should prove the benefit. Now, another useful rule, what kind of condition monitoring? Okay, if it needs to be done, what needs to be done? So for that, definitely understanding the system the system in general is critically important. Understanding all the failure modes of that system is critically important. Then we need to connect these failures with system, symptoms. Now we go from up to down, system failure mode symptoms. When we understand the symptoms, that is exactly what defines the technology you need. I need to move a little bit there on their side so you can see it. So that will be a way to define technology you need. Of course, there are some other parameters as well, but we will discuss them later. But are you able to find the symptoms in a proper stage, in a proper safe way at the lowest possible cost? Now, obviously, 
obviously from this, if you set up this mindset, there is no best technology. There is best for certain failure modes. I agree with that. There is a best combination of technologies. That's also very correct. They are all equally, absolutely equally valuable. And important to consider as well is when being in charge for, of condition monitoring means, by definition, determining condition of the asset and its ability to perform. Now, how can we choose just some failure modes and just some technologies, finding just some of the symptoms, if our task is to make sure that we know what is the condition of the asset and what is the ability of the asset to perform. That means all. That means from the electrical cabinet down to the discharge valve, everything, not just the rotating part of the things, because that's only one part of the possible problem, mechanical, electrical, valves, everything you see around yourself. Even the civil engineer has something to do, something to do with condition monitoring. Is this foundation fine? Now, need for multi-technology approach is quite self-explanatory here. Because if you change a mindset, and if you already have a mindset, thank God, determining condition of the asset and its ability to perform means that you have a huge responsibility to find all the failure modes and all the symptoms. So multi-technology approach is clearly self-explanatory and, and mandatory. Now let's go back to something considered fundamental, the IPF curve or design installation potential failure, functional failure, this one or any other similar because there are, there are so many out there. So it's, it's, uh, it's telling us what's happening in what stage, uh, the life cycle of the asset, the life, ci life cycle of the system. So it needs to be designed for reliability, for maintenance. It needs to be installed properly, operated properly, proactively uh, taken care of. Then we come to the predictive stage and then we'll be maybe able to find some problem in, in making or in a later stage. Then we have preventive, we'll find some symptoms, we have some time-based tasks. And then we have coming to the failure when the, when the, when the asset is not delivering the function anymore. And at the end of the day, we have this catastrophic failure. So PF curve is actually the time between the, the, the first possible moment when anomaly can be detected, the earlier the, the, the better, of course, and between functional failure when the asset is not delivering the function anymore. Now, many curves also contain technologies. And that's quite interesting because there are so many people, I use them also as well, I, I just, just catch on that. Uh, and those technologies are placed by stage detection. Which one is the earliest? And sometimes I see and feel that this actually creates competition, that people uh, take this, this PF curve and they say, hey, this is the proof. This is why I'm better than you. The, because it suggests some technologies being earlier, others later. And there's nothing wrong with that because some technologies really are earlier and some of them are later, but not that simple because there is something missing in this curve. So you can see if we skip uh, design for reliability, design for maintenance, then we have this IP interval, precision installation, laser alignment, thermal growth, uh, proper balancing, pipe strain, proper lubrication, properly operating, and then we come to the P point and we say, well, yes, in this case, ultrasound is the first, then it's vibration, then it's oil analysis, then you will hear audible noise, it will be hot to touch, mechanically loose, and then we have boom, and then machine stops delivering the function. So this is used very often, <clears throat> but it really requires some deeper thoughts because using this as an argument saying, I'm better than you or you are better than me, it's completely wrong. It can be very, very misleading because there is no one curve that fits all. This is one off. And unfortunately, we don't have 10,000 PF curves or DIPF curves with technology marked that will explain everything that can happen. 
Now here in this one, ultrasound is the earliest sign. Well, I'm coming from the ultrasound world, so I should be happy and shut up and say, okay, this is the best, this is, this is correct. Uh, in some others, you will have vibration. In some others, there will be oil analysis first and so on. So you can see that different PF curves will show you different uh, technologies at, the, as a different, at a different position. So is some, are some of those curves wrong? Actually not. They're all correct for the certain failure modes. The curve doesn't say what machine it applies to because we have uh, uh, X axis is time and Y is as a condition, but it doesn't say what kind of failure is talking about. It doesn't say what failure mode it applies to. It, it, well, I hope you understand the possible trap of misleading. So if my failure mode is unbalanced, then putting ultrasound spike energy at, at the first one is not really a clever thing to do because it doesn't work that way. Now, this curve that you see on the screen makes sense for bearing lubrication, cavitation, gears, valves, probably. But does it make sense for unbalanced resonance misalignment? Not really. So you can see we're talking about a still about same asset. We just discuss different failure mode and then it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't make sense for a simple reason, because ultrasound will not be the best way to detect unbalanced resonance or misalignment. There are other ways to do that. Now, does curve with vibration placed first make sense for all different failure modes and all different assets? Uh, surely not, because if we discuss electrical cabinets, it's not really useful. If we discuss some other thing, it's not useful. Does one with oil analysis first make sense for all? Not. It makes sense for the certain failure modes, but not for all of them. Thermography, same answer. So you can see none of them is one shoe fits all because the failure modes are not letting us to do that. It would be great if we can find everything with one technology. Really, the life would be so much simpler. But unfortunately, it's not. Now. It's always important to observe any PFDIPF curve with a failure mode in mind and say, yeah, this one, this one fits to this failure mode in this machine, but in a different failure mode in the same machine will be probably different. So each different asset, theoretically, should have different curve. E even each failure within this asset should have a different curve if you put technology there, if you, if you try to place technology. Now, if we want to look at the DIPF curve with technologies placed in time, now really be careful what you choose. Don't grab one curve and say, okay, this is the best, so I will do this, and in 10 years, if I have money and time and people, I will do that, and then maybe I will add this, it simply doesn't work that way. It's a completely different story. Now, electrical cabinet, unbalance, suction discharge or non-return valve, lubrication, bearing damage, cavitation, oil lubricated pump bearings. Imagine all this stuff. And you can find all this stuff with just one simple machine. Now, each of these segments can stop the machine, each of them. For each segment, there will be different technology for the earliest detection. So this game, I can find it first. I'm the best. Me too. Doesn't make sense when you, when you look at it this way. If you change the mindset of, of condition monitoring, you see that it doesn't really make much sense. Condition monitoring of a simple pump, not even talking about very complex machinery, means monitoring all failure modes. Failure modes that can impact to the overall condition and stop the pump from delivering function. Not just the fancy ones. Not just uh, 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 the ones that usually rotate. And uh, not just with technology which is considered a fancy one. For a very, very high level education people. And even, even more, we need to help those people. So how many technologies we need? Which one is the earliest detection? Which one is the best? 
Those are all questions that we can face in building the proper condition monitoring system. Now, what is missing when we mark technologies by detection time in, in, in any DIPF curve? Failure mode. This one is earliest for this failure mode. In different failure mode, it will be completely different. Now, using just some of the technologies, not one, maybe two, means covering just part of the failure modes. That means not being early in all covered failure modes. In other words, at the end of the day, not being very successful. Of course, using no technology or one technology, we cannot compare this this, these two situations. We can always say that condition monitoring is successful because it's much better than without condition monitoring. But is it condition monitoring that brings the full benefit? That's, that's the question. It's quite clear from this that versus doesn't work because the, the essence of condition monitoring is telling us that versus doesn't work, with works, same like in medicine. Now, being a vibration analyst and having ultrasound guy on your team makes you better and more successful because the overall effectiveness, effect that you make on the company as a condition monitoring team will be much better, will be much higher. So you will be better because you will have somebody feeding you with additional data and your overall success will be better and that will impact you definitely. Now being ultrasound and having infrared on a team makes you better and more successful because ultrasound is no use in, 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 in detecting the failure modes with a symptom of high temperature. Being all of the above and then having oil analysis on your team will definitely make you better and more successful. So you can see the more technologies we have, the more different people we'll have, will be more and more successful. So it's equally true for all technologies. And when I say about the, the, the technology, I can put my nose inside that technology. I mean, smelling the asset, sometimes you can, you can feel the burning, touching the asset, watching, everything is included in condition monitoring. So we do need everything, all the weapons we can choose. So what technology you need? As a, as a conclusion, look at your failure modes and symptoms. Look at the detectability to try to be as early as possible. Look at the criticality of this asset <clears throat> and look at the impact of this certain failure to the machine. Look at the history of root causes. Very interesting place to look at. And many more data that you can put your hands on, as much data as possible. And then you can choose the proper technology that you need technologies for a certain asset. Now, there's another aspect often forgotten, and that's quite sad that it's forgotten. Uh, and that is your resources, your human resources. How many people you have on board? Now, that is a very tricky and, and, and critical question because we have this discussion about technology, about abilities of each technology, about condition monitoring uh, a mindset, a proper condition monitoring mindset. Then we know what we need to achieve. We need to achieve improvement in reliability. We need to give a proper information for the improvement because condition monitoring by itself doesn't really improve reliability too much. It's providing the information. And that's the critical part, because, of course, on the other side, you cannot improve if you don't have the information. So all this put together, it's great from the point of knowledge, understanding, mindset. And then we come to the point and we say, OK, we understand everything. We know what we need to do. We know what technologies we need. Let's do it. And then sometimes you get shocked because you look around yourself and you say, hmm, it's only me. Sad but very often true. Uh, maybe I'm just cartooning it when I say it's only me, only one person, but I've never seen a condition monitoring team that, that, that says there is enough of us. No, there is always the same discussion. There is always the same approach. There is just a little bit of us, condition monitoring, and there is more and more of them every day. 
failure modes. So there are more and more enemies, more and more ways that this machine can stop, and there is just a few of us trying to detect this problem. So how many people you have becomes critically important question. How many of people in the, in, in, in the organization are actually involved in condition monitoring? This is a topic to discuss because there is never enough people. Never. But there's also reality. There, it's not likely that you will get more people. So, yeah, we can complain and cry on each other's shoulder and say, oh, we don't have enough people. Uh, they are not letting us to hire new, new guys. Uh, and they said, uh, okay, we can stop crying because that's reality. You will never have as much people as you would like to. That is the fact. So let's see what we can do inside, within this reality. Uh, with limited number of people, you need to limit number of monitored assets. This is something that, 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 that is the first step. Okay, I have limited number of people and I cannot monitor all of the assets that I would like to monitor, so I have to limit them. Then you need to limit the number of technologies. Of course, if I have one person or two person, I cannot use eight technologies. That's it's quite difficult. It's practically impossible. You do not have enough time to investigate. Well, that's a tricky one. And that's quite a problematic one. Investigating means we collected the data, we understand the data, we found the problem. There is a defect. There is a anomaly, very early defect. That's all fine. What do you need to do next? You need to investigate. You need to find a root cause, remove it, and improve. That actually has a huge effect on reliability improvement because that will not happen again. You remove the root cause and improve. That is reliability improvement. Just finding the problem and coming every six months with the same problem, that's not really improvement. That just proves that you are a well-trained condition monitoring engineer. But if we speak about this part here, investigate. You need time for that. You need time for that. It's impossible to predict how much time you will need to analyze the signal find the problem, investigate, and find the root cause. So I call it a curse of being good at condition monitoring. So there are so many people that are really good at condition monitoring, but there is a curse about it that's followed them, and I will talk about it right now. So the first option in this situation when you don't have enough people <coughs> is that you limit number of assets based on criticality analysis, and then you compare it with the time you have on your team, of course, you compare the abilities of your team and then you put it all together and then you say, okay, this is what I can do. I cannot do 84 assets, I can do 83. So there is a limit. You can stretch as much as you want. Other assets are left out. Among the assets that are left out, there will always be assets where condition monitoring doesn't make sense anyway. But in this selection, you will definitely remove from your, from your uh, program some assets that actually it would be very useful to do condition monitoring. But you have to be reasonable with your resources. So you stretch your time over as many assets as possible. And the, the natural next thing to do is you're trying to plan time for, for asset. So if I have 100 hours available, and I have uh, uh, 100 assets, I can spend one hour on one asset. That's mathematically correct, if you try to look at it this way. But it's not really practical. It doesn't work in practice. Planning analysis and investigation is not possible. So I, I always, when we are live, I always try to ask the same question. So uh, if there is a potential problem on an epicyclic gearbox, quite complex one, and you get absolutely all data, vibration, ultrasound, oil analysis, thermography, you get everything you need. How much time do you need to analyze this the signal, find the problem, and define the root cause? Saying that time is impossible. So this is the fact we need to be aware of. 
You can be really lucky and find a problem in 10 minutes, but you might be investigating this issue for three weeks and both of them are reality. So you cannot plan time per asset. You cannot plan your analysis. It simply doesn't work in practice. What you end up doing is actually scratching the surface because this is what you have, this is what you can do, and you can only scratch the surface. No time to investigate real root causes. No time to create improvement, because if you don't find the root cause, you will not be able to create, create improvement. So what you do practically is you analyze the signal, you say there is a problem or there's no problem. If there is a problem, and if you are really good in condition monitoring, and you have some time, you can say the problem is this bearing, we need to change the bearing. Uh, end of story. Well, that's not the end of story. That's actually the beginning of the story. Yes, I found the bearing problem. There is a damage on the bearing. Let's change the bearing. Fine. Now, this happens after one, one, one and a half year of, of, of operation. So the real question is why this bearing failed. That is the real job behind it. So that's a step two. And for that, you need time because that will actually bring huge benefit for the company if you remove the root cause. But for that, you need time. Actually, what I'm trying to say behind all this, no time to use your entire knowledge. So can you imagine somebody who spent 10 years in, educate, in education for condition monitoring in, in one or two technologies with all this fantastic experience, and then you give him a timetable. Say you have 100 hours, you have 100 assets. So that means one, one hour per asset. Let's go, 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 go. It's completely wrong because you are not giving the opportunity for all this knowledge and experience to be really used to bring benefit. So I, I, I often speak with, with a lot of my colleagues and sometimes I ask uh, one of my colleagues who is vibration analyst, what do you wish for Christmas? And he says, more time, more time. When I have all this data, when I found the problem, if, if somebody can just put me in the room and, and, and stop telephone from ringing and stop all the other activities and let me dig deep and find the root cause and the problem and improve it, and I will never have to see this same problem again. That means using this knowledge. What's the point of the knowledge if it's not used? To use it, you need time. As a result, we have, in these cases, sometimes as a result, we have ineffective condition monitoring. That means, it doesn't mean bad condition monitoring. It means it could be better. And then you burn out of frustration. Uh, again, I'm talking about people and I simply have to talk about people because technology and people together are condition monitoring. I mean, if you keep on finding the same problem every three months, and you don't have time to investigate because you're already late with other 56 assets and you keep on finding the same problem, I mean, that's quite frustrating. That's quite frustrating. And it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't look any, very, very noble. Also, you can imagine a reliability leader if you come to him with the same problem every six months. He will not like to see your face anymore because you're coming with the problems. You're not coming to say, okay, you know, remember the problem of the last time? That will never happen again. We can now talk some other problems. That's the point. So second option is that you can stretch yourself and your team over the limits. Some people do that. That means you will work 25 hours a day, figuratively, and you will really be sweating and working extremely hard, uh, and you will juggle like an artist. So that means you will juggle with your resources and you will push people to the limits. You will push yourself to the limits. Try to do absolutely everything and then you succeed. So you can imagine it's just like in the sport. So in the sport, you work hard, you train, you train, you train, and then you come to the Olympic Games and you win the gold. Wow, what a feeling. So you can imagine you work like, a, like crazy, 24 hours a day, you push your team, you are all fantastic heroes and then you succeed. You have excellent results. That's the moment when you feel the victory, when you feel that actually the purpose of your work is there. People can see it. That's correct. 
but then you have the best part because every medal has two sides. You get a great congratulations. You are being a hero. You're an employee of the month. Everybody applauds you. Everybody says, wow, we have a fantastic condition monitoring team. You see the failures are going down. Our uptime is going up. The, 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 the profitability is going up. Safety is going up. Everything fantastic. And then you have this good boy. Great. Fantastic job. No, of course, since you performed so good on this 100 assets, now we want you to cover more assets. Why? Because you are good. If you are bad, nobody will ask you to cover more assets, of course. They will just say, okay, just let him do what he's doing. In, in, in six months, we'll fire him and that's it. But if you are good, this is the normal, normal consequence. Cover more assets, please. Cover more failure modes. Because you can say, hey, we are, we are doing vibration only now. Can we add oil analysis? Can we add ultrasound? More failure modes. And that's your task. And find all the root causes. Because you are so good, you, you performed fantastically last year. Now we need, to, we need you to do more. Find all root causes and remove them. That will have a huge impact on our, on our, on our reliability. Because you already, already did, did so much. That's the task. That's the task you are given if you are good. But there is a small print always. And that small print says you should do all that with the same resources. And that's the sad part. Because <laughs> you're already stretched over your limits, you and your team. And we would like you to do all this with the same resources. But you know I need six more people. Let's see about it. Let's see about it. We need to discuss it. So it's not that you will get six people. Maybe you will get two. And you actually need six. The problem is that you were already overstretched last year. And now you just get more tasks and you have a little bit more in a team. Building a condition monitoring team is a very slow process. Getting new people, training them and making them useful is a very slow process. So you can imagine getting new tasks with the same resources just because you did a good job makes you wonder, well, maybe it's better if I do a bad job. Of course, that's not an option. We are moral people and we, we would never do that. But we have to see how to fight with this situation. We have to see how to do more with the same. I will not say more with less, which many people over say, or often say, but if you stay with the same resources, let's see how we can do more. Because you can easily get yourself in a lose-lose situation. But if you lose, company loses. Decrease of reliability, decrease of profit, and that's a loss for absolutely everyone. And this, what I would like to show you now, is reality of your resources. So you have a small number of specialists for the certain areas. Usually small number, just the tip of the pyramid. Then you have entire team who is involved this way or another around the reliability maintenance operation. <clears throat> so that's a little bit more people. And then you have an army of operators. So this is how it works. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so you have a small number of specialists, a little bit more people or a lot more people as an entire team <coughs> surrounding operation, then you have operators. Now, reality about this is those who know how to perform condition monitoring don't have time. They don't have enough time. So we are talking about specialists here. Then those who have time, and it was proven in many studies that uh, operators are in certain industries, of course, are most under, un underutilized power. In certain industries, of course, I have to be very careful about that. <coughs> not because they are working, they are, they are lazy, but because the organization is not such. So you have people who know and they have no time. Then you have people who have time but, 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 but don't know. So you are stuck in a situation when somebody will walk slowly and you will be running like crazy, try to do everything, and you should wonder sooner or later, how do I engage this guy? To help me. Because if you turn it upside down, this is what will give you more time. 
So for the specialists on the top, figuratively on the top, I'm not putting it on the top, there is the same respect for everyone in the organization. You need to give them more available time for analysis when there is anomaly or defect indication. So that means when you scan all the assets and you say, okay, there is an indication, there is anomaly. Now we need to have this specialist with, specialist with this huge knowledge to completely focus on that, take as much time as you need, because now you have time and we need you to, mo to, to, to focus on this, find the problem, find the root cause, recommend how to, how to remove it and improve. Then you have the team that was in the, middle, in, the mid, in the middle of the pyramid, the last one as well, they can do data collection. They can do that binary diagnostic conclusions because there are so many defects that are binary. They can do unconditional lubrication, which is extremely important part of reliability. They can actually filter the indication for specialist attention. So that means that we will, we will do the, the first line of defense saying good, 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 bad. Give that to the specialist and let him focus on it. He will check all the data in general as well, but we need to give them more time because condition monitoring often, often fights against dragons. So there is a huge, big, dangerous dragon uh, uh, spilling fire all around. And there is a big enemy you have to fight. But don't forget, every dragon in the beginning was an egg. So if we do the binary stuff properly and we find an egg, remove the egg, there will never be a dragon. If we can, we can cut down the, at least 50% of the, of the attention of the specialist, we have suddenly so much available resources to use that huge knowledge properly. Unconditional lubrication, of course, I don't even need to talk about that. It's removing the problem in the first place. And then you have operators, energy-saving data collection. Energy-saving program, just imagine steam preps, steam leaks, uh, air leaks, all the other pressurized leaks, very valuable uh, energy source, very, very valuable, valuable gases. It's all energy-saving. It's a huge money. It's not as huge as... If you, if, you, if you save the compressor, but it's everyday money and it's a low fruit. This is something that you can prove that you made a benefit tomorrow morning. And then it's much easier to ask for more resources if you prove the benefit tomorrow morning, not promising the benefit in two years. We all know, who are involved, all of us involved in reliability, we know very well that we can easily promise huge benefit in two years, millions. Let's be honest, uh, uh, we are all humans. Yes, you can promise me 10 million in two years, but if you show me 5,000 tomorrow morning, hmm, that's the proof you are really good. So now I trust you. So we need to combine these two things. Now, if it's changed this pyramid upside down, those who know have more time. So that knowledge can be actually used in a proper way. Imagine somebody who was trained for 10, 15 years with all this, this huge knowledge. We need to use that knowledge. And those who know now have more time because those who have time now know. Now know how to do certain tasks, not all of them. It's not the point of this process to create a, 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 a 5,000 condition monitoring engineers. That's not the point. It's the point to create a culture and to put technology inside that culture. To say, to say, I am operating in this workstation. My, my uh, advantage is that I know this machine very well because I work on this machine for 10 years. And now I can use some technology for some simple tests and simple checks. And for, that, for those parts that I don't understand, I can collect data for you. So you can imagine how, my, how many things can be filtered before it even comes to the specialist. Now, obviously, you need to distribute certain tasks down the pyramid. And they are all equally valuable. There is no difference in value. Relatively simple, but very valuable task. Uh, immediate conclusions for them, 
and data for you. So imagine you can have somebody um, 40 years ago putting a screwdriver on a bearing or now putting the ultrasound on a bearing, which can be quite simple and having the alarm triggered or not triggered and saying uh, to you, top specialist, you don't need to visit this machine. Oh, it's fine. I'm actually have time because I'm working on this machine and I do a simple path check every day or every week. You cannot afford to check the machine every week. You don't have that time. But this person can actually make some immediate conclusions and he can provide you data. So I can conclude. And for that, I cannot conclude. I just collected the data. So you have it. It's just like a triage in hospitals. You cannot say that nurses are less valuable than doctors just because of the education. That would be complete nonsense and complete disrespect. But they all do jobs at a different level with absolutely same value. So just imagine if you have 10 people coming with a, with a headache. And let's put all of them to the, to the specialist and to a, 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 a magnetic resonance test. It doesn't work that way. So there is a triage. There is somebody who's saying, good, good, good. Hmm, this smells like a problem. Let's put him on an MR. So somebody is doing a triage. And that job is extremely valuable. Only because of that job is done properly, you have several top specialists in the hospital who have enough time to focus on your problem if you really have a problem. But to do that, to be able to do that, you need to give them technology they can use. So you filter down condition monitoring tasks all the way to the bottom, as deep as you can, but you need to give them technology they can use. Uh, we have many approaches, of course, visual test, smelling, touching, some, some simple measurement, check the manometer, all this stuff. That works. This is operator driven reliability. We know that. Some call it autonomous maintenance. But I like to call it more condition monitoring than maintenance. But that task needs to be simple and clear for them. And they need to be able to perform com complex tasks for you. So all the data they will collect will be, will be your chance to do complex, complex tasks. It cannot be done with every technology. Of course, now we have this, this weighing of not what is the best, not what is me too, but what can I use at the different stages? What technology is only for two or three specialists? One technology can be for two or three specialists plus 25 people from the from the reliability and maintenance team. And what technology can be for a specialist, middle guys, and for the operators? because then you can, you can actually filter it down through the pyramid. With vibration analysis, it's quite difficult. We know that because it's a most often, not always, it's most often it's a specialist only job. With oil analysis, also quite difficult. You can train certain people to take a proper oil sample, but oil analysis itself, it's, it needs to be done by specialists, highly trained on that. Infrared to the certain level, not completely, of course, but to the certain level, because you need to understand thermogram. You need to, you need to be able to take the proper measurement. But with ultrasound, it's quite interesting. It's both for specialists and non-specialists. Not, not talking about better, but it's, it's just simple when you want it to be simple. It's complex when you need it to be complex. And it works in both areas equally successfully. And it's nothing about being better. You will never hear about me to, uh, from me saying that ultrasound is better. I am coming from ultrasound world, but I will never say that because it's simply not correct. Uh, it's like that simply because of the nature of ultrasound applications. Because if you carefully observe what are the applications where ultrasound is used, then it actually tells you, hmm, this is simple. People can do this after two hours training. But this is very complex. For this, you need years of experience. So leak detection, very easy to push to operate and driven reliability. Uh, valves, quite easy to push to operate to driven reliability. Primary rotating asset monitoring, quite easy to push to ODR. Quite easy. Because 
if you have a proper database, you have a proper technology, you set your proper alarms properly, and you have just a little bit of training for the guy, he will know how to put the sensor on a proper way to collect data. Tightness, hydraulics, cavitation, easily pushed down to operator-driven reliability. Operator can check for cavitation. Very often we have operator checking for tightness. People who are operating machines with the hydraulic components are usually checking the hydraulics. Now lubrication plus condition monitoring, and I'm putting a big emphasis on this, not lubrication only as an island, but lubrication and condition monitoring, quite easy to push to operate the driven reliability and loop team. So suddenly you have a loop team on your side. Suddenly we are counting heads in, 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 in loop team and saying they are actually helping the condition monitoring. That's where you, that's where you get more people. Now to picture it clearly, and uh, this is the case with many of our of users we train. In the morning, the instrument is used by operator. Uh, for, the, for the air leaks, probably. Hour later, process people check valves. During the lunch, operators check pump cavitation. After lunch, you have a fast test and data collection on the motor. If it's clear that is a problem, okay, let's, let's set up the alarm. If it's not clear, data goes to specialists anyway. Uh, after them, maintenance technician checking gearboxes and collecting data. And some alarm triggered. Now it goes to the specialist saying that you need to make analysis on epi epicyclic gearbox. Still with the same technology, still with the same approach. But you can get much more people helping you. You will not be overwhelmed with the problems that shouldn't be on your desk. And then in this moment, when you say, okay, alarm triggered, I should analyze this and you should include additional technology. This is the point where you definitely need to include additional technology, especially if you're not absolutely sure you find a root cause with one technology only. Now, each of these users during this one day delivered profit. You get all that time that they actually did something if each of them did something for seven minutes, it's seven minutes more for you. Energy saving program, binary defect detection, filtration of indications plus data collection in the same time. It's benefit for the company and it's a benefit for the CM team. Your benefit is that you get all this extra time. Now imagine being having 100 uh, guys included in this in, in any kind of program, anything, visual inspection, whatever. And each of them gives you five minutes of, of their time. That's 500 minutes for you and a lot of, lot of, a mountain of very important data. Now, applications of ultrasound in industry are lubrication, rotating assets, leaks, electrical, valves, steam traps, hydraulic, tightness. Now, the, the, the key element of why it's easy to push it to operate driven reliability is because the menu is big. The menu is big. If we are working only with rotating assets, it's so-so. So it's not a big deal to push it down to the operate driven reliability. But if I can be sure that the lubrication will be done fine, if I can be sure that the, that the elect, elect, electrician's team Another team can also use the same technology to remove some other problems. Somebody will, checking the, will be checking the valves because, in my opinion, the suction and discharge valve have something to do with rotating assets, especially pumps. And then the steam traps, they have a huge impact on operation and huge impact on energy. When you put all this together, you can immediately identify so many different people that you can actually employ, that you can actually give them instrument in hand and a little bit of training, just focus on his application and he can deliver a benefit. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. It's a, it's a big, uh, uh, it's a game of the big numbers and you create a culture. You really create a culture, you create people who are interested in condition monitoring. So if you look at the asset, any asset, you see that you, you need a holistic approach. You need vibration analysis. You need ultrasound. 
you definitely need tomography. You need motor current analysis. You need oil analysis. And more. Definitely. And more. Not only this. So from the detecting a problem, is it all okay? Or is, is there a problem? Which is a very important issue. So you can have a very, very nice bearing to a very, very, very bad bearing. Then through trending, which is sometimes quite simple. Things can go up, things can go down, things, things can stay stable before and after lubrication. And then to analysis, the part that everybody likes. But, you know, when you come to the point of analysis, you already have a problem. So it's not a good news. Uh, I would like to stay before that as much as possible. Through analyzing time signal and spectrum and whatever else is needed. But you can see here that you see you have three different levels. And if you employ proper people with a proper level of training, you can have so many people on your side, not being full-time condition monitoring, but being involved in condition monitoring as your allies. Now, if you know all this that I just explained, now add ultrasonic guided lubrication in this strategy. So suddenly you are adding uh, condition-based lubrication, proper lubrication into this strategy and as a part of CM. Uh, one of the, as, I, as I'm a trainer and instructor for these issues very often, one of the things that I always first ask, where is the position of condition monitoring and lubrication? Is there a connection? How close they are? And the worst possible thing you can have is that they are like two separate, two islands, very, 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 very separated, very far away. That's a very big mistake because condition-based lubrication is doing condition monitoring. And this is the data that is completely free of charge for condition monitoring. You suddenly have several people that just joined your team. So these two teams should be like two fingers together. It's a completely additional topic, but I just want to touch it at this occasion. Now, if we know that 60% of the, uh, there are different statistics and different numbers, so I just don't want to throw any number, 80, 90, 75, whatever, let's say 60, let's be very modest. Uh, if you have 60% of the problems in rotating equipment caused by lubrication, now just imagine if you do a proper lubrication and remove 60% of the problems, what is the impact to condition monitoring team? First of all, you remove one big root cause. Then you, you dramatically decrease number of, of failures. And then your view is completely, clear, completely different because now there is no famous question. Uh, the values are up. Hmm, maybe it's lubrication. Let's put some grease. No, that's a way. So somebody cleaned the path from you saying it's not lubrication. It's done properly. Here is the data. We remove the problems. Now what's left is for you. It has a huge impact to condition monitoring. Now we all know that when the lubrication is done in a bad way, you usually have this, some kind of, of recommendation coming from who knows where, ends up with this, with a check mark, which is again, the usual standard of operating procedure, so you have something that is maybe correct, ending up with something that was maybe done, and who knows what was done actually, and who knows what was the condition of the bearing before and after lubrication. But again, that's a completely different topic, but very dangerous one. And when, when, when you ask for responsibility, then you have this. Sorry, it wasn't me, it was the formula. It's a really fantastic excuse. So you have somebody who is following the rules in a manual or on a nameplate on a machine or whatever, put uh, 62.5 grams every 3,865 hours and you will be fine. So of course, it's a great excuse. Whatever happens, you say, sorry, I just did the job as, as they told me. It's the formula. It's not me. But that doesn't help. Excuses belong to history. What counts is the uptime and safety and environment. So is your machine working properly? That's the real question, 
not excuses. So job must be done correctly, especially if it comes to lubrication, because the proper lubrication is proactive. We are not talking about predictive or, rea or reactive. We're talking about proactive here. But if you ask me, and if you ask many people who already try this approach, it must bring additional benefit to condition monitoring team. So that means now we have a great condition-based lubrication team that are doing a fantastic job, and they are in this box, doing a fantastic job in that box. But what is the connection with another box, with a condition monitoring team? So the question is, if I'm sitting in a condition monitoring team, I would ask myself, well, how can these guys help me? So they are visiting the bearings every day anyway. So there is a workforce that is engaged around the same machines that I need to visit. So more or less, we are doing the same, the same job. So how do I bring benefit? So the strategy is the point. Strategy means data. What happened when, how, and why? What did you do? Why did you do it? What was the outcome? And what was the process? So now imagine you have all this data saying that today at 12.05, the signal was that much and the alarm was lubrication needed considering the real condition in that moment, in six steps, I put 18 grams of grease with a, with, a, with a sequential drop of the signal. The signal after my action as a lubrication is that much. Now imagine what you have as a condition monitoring it is in this data. That means building a strategy to connect condition monitoring and lubrication. And then you have all these graphs saying, what happened before and what happened after. So you have a trending. Collecting data for, con for, for condition-based lubrication is nothing else than complete ultrasound trending. This is exactly the job that ultrasound condition monitoring engineer should be doing as a part of condition monitoring team. Now, the beauty of this thing is that now the grease technician, the loop guy, is doing that job. Now imagine how much time that suddenly creates and how much benefit. So you have a complete ultrasound trending. You have behavior before and after lubrication. So this is a golden nugget. Now I have the rotating machine and this is like a medical chart of the bearing. So that means this is the condition when I visited it before lubrication and this is reaction to lubricant. What happened? Everyone who was ever analyzing the, 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 any kind of rotating machine was asking this question, is it lubrication? So if you remove that and say, no, 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 sorry, this is behavior before and after, you have a huge, huge help in your analysis. And of course, outcome of each grease replenishment process. Now this is complete anthracite trending. So that's condition monitoring. We call it lubrication, but that's condition monitoring. Now, if you have additional job and data you are looking at right now are collected naturally as a part of the job by the grease guy. Time waveform before and after grease replenishment. Spectrum before and after grease replenishment. So this is something that was done at the zero cost. Zero cost for anyone, not just for condition monitoring, zero cost for anyone, because now this person is visiting bearing anyway, this person is lubricating bearings anyway, but now he's doing it in a proper way. And by the way, and he doesn't even need to know that, he's, he's collecting the dynamic data, which is crucial and critical for any kind of analysis in condition monitoring. So this is more than lubrication excellence. This is condition monitoring data. And this is why it's a must to connect these two areas. Because as I explained before, if you have a correct mindset in, in condition, condition monitoring, sooner or later, we all face the same problem. I don't have enough people. I need allies. I need friends. I need more people helping me to do my job. The first one is operator driven reliability. Choose the right technologies put them strategically around the pyramid 
and ask some people to give you a few minutes of their time in a week. And the second huge help is that you suddenly have a complete loop team on your side. Is it different? Yes. Is it because of that good and help? Absolutely yes. Is it competition? Absolutely not. This is the point when you actually have to see that people doing a different job can be your best friends. And this is a pr probably a great example. And this is how it often works and at the end how it should work. So we have a machine that we have a specialist in vibration analysis, Mary B. Good, with a high training, early bird, oil analysis, education and training high, Saul Goodman, infrared thermography, education and training high, Bart Ender, critical role, high education, ultrasound. And then they have a poor grease guy comes there and just greasing the bearing. But we want to change it. He needs a title as well. He's somebody, Sam Body. His reliability role is critical. His specialty is condition-based lubrication, and he should be educated and trained highly and continuously. Because what this picture needs, needs, to, needs to say is that all of us doing condition monitoring, we gather around the machine, we put zillion of sensors, and we are trying to observe. So what condition monitoring is doing is observing. Is there a problem or is there not a problem? So we are observing the condition. And by default, we all know very well that condition monitoring engineers are highly educated, highly trained with a, with a high technology in their hands. But don't forget, they are observing the condition. They are not creating the condition. And then you have this grease guy with a grease gun coming and nobody even pays attention to him coming to put something in the machine he is actually creating the condition we are trying to monitor so there is a, a huge discrepancy there he can destroy the machine me or any of my colleagues just by monitoring we cannot destroy a machine we cannot do anything we can try to understand the machine but this guy is creating the condition. So if I want to choose a best friend <clears throat> for condition monitoring, that would be Mr. Sam Body, who is a specialist in condition-based lubrication. Because he will stop making problems, he will start making improvements, and not only that, he will feed me with data on a daily basis. So condition monitoring mindset needs to explode over these boundaries and limits of just a few technologies, just a few applications, and just, uh, just some of the assets. Everything is important and everybody is important. Every failure mode is important. So the five people you have just seen, uh, there are more people in the team, there are more technologies, of course, but the picture, the movie was not big enough to show everybody. They are all using different technologies. They are all different people. They have different knowledge and expertise. So they are in different positions. They have different view on things. You know, you know very well that, that oil analysis people are sometimes coming from chemistry. Sometimes you know that, that, that uh, vibration analysis are, uh, analysis, uh, uh, analyst is coming from mechanical engineering. <coughs> So you have all these different people with different mentalities, attitudes, different knowledge and expertise. But the more people from top to shop floor, if you put different technologies, different people, and you gather all this knowledge and expertise, and you involve a lot of people, then the situation suddenly changes fantastically. And we have much more efficiency. And we have each of us, so one plus one is not two in that case, but becomes four. And it's very effective and very valuable for the company. Success of the good condition monitoring program is measured by number of things that never happened. It's a good news. It's a good definition. It can also be a problem. It can be a problem if you don't report them properly. So one day, I just fear that that day will never come. One day you can conclude your year and say nothing bad happened.
We didn't have any failure. We didn't have any stoppage. We didn't have any spillage of material. There was no safety risk. Everything was working fantastically. So the evaluation of your work will be the list of things that never happened. And one day when you have a silence and you say, nothing is happening, that means you're very successful. Don't forget to report it because people are not very good in seeing things that never happened. And make sure that bad things don't happen. That is our job. I thank you for your attention and I certainly hope this was interesting and at a certain level useful for you. Thank you.